Unspoiled Network podcast. This is Spoil Me, covering Mage Errant, Book 6, Chapters 28, 29, and 30. In these chapters, our friends are getting used to their new affinities, and then they run into some other alien peoples, but they're human though, so they're not like super alien. But you guys, I I don't have a good feeling about this. Welcome to Spoil Me. Welcome to the show, everyone. I am Natasha. Thank you so much to Dan for commissioning this episode. I really wonder sometimes, like, when you're watching, if you've commissioned this and you know some shit is coming. And I brush against the possibility. Do you, like, chortle to yourself? Is there, like, a little cackle that happens? Because I know I have this happen when I'm recording with an unspoiled person, but I can't like give into it in the midst of the recording and give things away. So I have to keep it inside. And I have to imagine that if I were listening, I would be just completely like snickering to myself over everything out loud. You know what I'm saying? Because I mean, I'll do that even just with reading a book where a character is theorizing on something and they're like kind of close, but not quite. I'll still just sort of be like, (laughs) so I feel really anxious about this world they're in. And I'm going to start at the beginning. I promise I'll go back, but I just really want to address that. There's a few, there's a few red flags for me. And It's the sort of thing where it's like, am I reading too much into it or is this a purposeful like trail of breadcrumbs that I'm supposed to maybe pick up on? Or at least if you go back and read it, once you know what's going on, you see it. And I can't tell because it could be nothing. It could be nothing. But I just had it was just enough moments of me going oh, that's weird what's that about it, it happened enough times close enough together that I, re- I i'm starting to feel like that means something so so we'll get there i swear to it but i'm going to start at the beginning now chapter 28 uninvited guests so they are in Cometrius. That's the like name of the world that they are in. I don't know if, and this is like, you know, a, a question that I'm not sure if you know the answer to, Dan, you probably do. Um, I'm not even sure if it's like actually in the text and I simply missed it or what. But is Cometrius like the name of the whole planet? Like when they say they're, they're, they're visiting different worlds, does that mean different dimensions or does that mean different planets? Like if you are going to visit a different planet, you can get there f- with the right travel from earth to get to Venus, right? It's a place you can get to in theory, but another dimension you would need a portal to, and it's not part of our universe. Venus does not exist in that universe or unless it's a parallel universe. You know what I'm saying? I don't know if Cometrius is meant to be a planet that they could have reached in another in another way, theoretically, and the labyrinth is simply a shortcut to it, or if it's a like dimension that's totally different. Um, and I'm kind of I've been assuming it's like a planet thing, and I realized that I'm not positive of that. Um, Dan says I think planet. Okay, that's what I thought, but I wasn't. Sure. And I'm not even sure that it really matters that much, but it was something I was sort of stopping and thinking about, like, exactly 
how big a deal is it that they're in different worlds? And don't get me wrong, traveling to another planet is still like a very big deal. So I'm not trying to act like that's nothing. But it's an entirely different proposition than being in a different dimension, which feels more dangerous somehow, even though I don't know that's necessarily even true. Um, Dan says it's a mix. Sometimes it's a planet on another universe. Okay. So if that's true, my question about the name Cometrius, that's the name of the planet that they're on, right? Cometrius isn't the name of the entire universe. Like Anastas is the planet they're on in their universe, right? I'm just curious, like, you know, because we can say that we're on the planet Earth, but if you try and name what dimension we're in, and, you know, we don't have a name for that, kind of makes me think of, like, Spider-Verse, and for, I think there's, like, Dimension 42, or Iteration, or whatever it is that uh, Will White says. So, I'm just sort of, like, wondering how specific it is, or is Cometrius the name of the country within the planet? Like, this labyrinth is the Cometrius labyrinth and it's a really specific labyrinth because all of these places they've been have more than one labyrinth so i i'm curious about how you differentiate on another world between the different labyrinths as well as the different worlds like are the labyrinths labeled by number or is it based on like, is there some sort of like magical way to place them in space, you know, like mapping that this is all just for my own information. I'm just curious about it. And it seems like the sort of thing that a writer like John Beers would have figured out because he seems to really like these details. So again, emphasizing that this is not necessary for me to know, but it was something that I was sort of thinking about as I was reading and the fact that like one Gilvacran's guide to worlds is telling them where to go. It seems to take for granted that if they come out of a Cometrian labyrinth, it's always going to be one particular Cometrian labyrinth, which I'm going to guess means that like every labyrinth doesn't all connect to every world. Although I don't know that that's not true. I don't know. You know, um, let's see. Amic Shard says, I think dimensions, they talk about ether being different. That's true. Amic Shard says, ether is the erosion of the dimension. Dan says, yeah, name of the planet. I think MX is right. It can be dimensions too. It's definitely not a country. Okay. Uh, MX says, my brain was assuming something like cradle with an iteration slash dimension having one main planet. Um, Eduardo says, I just found a reply by John Bierce in the subreddit about, he says it is planet. Okay. Ooh. Yeah. I'm just like really, uh, he is talking about Anastas there. Is the name, okay, so Anastas is the name of the whole planet. So if somebody were to have a guide to worlds coming from Cometria and they were told they were coming out in the labyrinth at Storm Skyhold, I was about to say Stormhold, Skyhold, would that, would that be the only labyrinth they could come out of? I'm assuming that would just be called like the Anastas Labyrinth, right? You're on Anastas. But it, are there other labyrinths that also connect to Anastas? Are they all called kind of the same thing? Or are they... Be, do all the different labyrinths connections with different worlds have a different name? It's all, again, I'm just putting this out there. It's not important, but I'm just curious. So anybody who, you know, has some more information on that, let me know. And... You could go to the Discord, probably a good spot for it. I also, um, I don't know how many people here are patrons, but Patreon has recently enabled a chat function on their app, which is actually really fun. And I created a, a 
chat room on there basically it's called a lounge that is all about episodes so you can go in there as well if you have difficulty with discord which i know a lot of people struggle with because discord is kind of confusing if you're not used to that sort of formatting so um anyway anyway so the the way that they're going through this labyrinth the first thing that is sort of weird is that all of the creatures that they come out in this labyrinth there's a feeling like nothing lives here like it all gets cleared out over and over again and this is something that's um that godric is really not even quite sure how to describe but it's really interesting to me the combo of how different this labyrinth feels and the bureaucracy directly on the other side of it. And that feels connected. I don't know how exactly like, but there's something about the vibe of this place. That's off. The vibes are off. Okay. It's just that simple. Um, there is sort of an upside though, at this point, Hugh has his magic back. So he's really enjoying like taking care of himself and not needing to rely on everybody else, which is also really helpful to his friends because it was, you know, sort of taking it out of them, having to keep an eye on him and protect him all the time. And now that they don't have to worry about that, they can sit back a little bit and relax while he handles shit because he's just out here doing everything simply because he's enjoying being able to do it so much that he's, you know, kind of overcorrecting. Um, and it says Hugh and Talia were competing to see who could annihilate monsters before they even approached the crown, the Stormward crown. And they kind of get in an argument about it. Uh, there's a moment here. There was nothing Godric could say right now to help. Mostly because Godric didn't understand the situation, and he didn't understand how the ritual could have worked without Candoran awakening. A particularly cynical part of Godric offered him an unpleasant answer, but he did his best to ignore it. Friends, I don't know what that is. What's his cynical answer? Like, I'm really... I don't know if he means that Kandoran maybe could have just like ditched Hugh or that he got his like abilities back, but Kandoran is still dead and it didn't go the way that Hugh thought, but he doesn't explore this. And I'm like, it, maybe it's something I haven't even thought of. Um, and yet yeah, this is the part the Cometrian labyrinth was odd, not in its structure. It was remarkably similar to Skyhold's labyrinth, but in the fact that none of the monsters felt settled, that none of it had the feeling of an actual ecosystem. It was almost as though the labyrinth were being regularly cleared out, but that didn't make sense given what Galvacrin had written about this region of Cometrius. There were only supposed to be a few pastoral nomads wandering through the area, and they largely avoided the labyrinth entrance. So Galvacrin's a little bit off here like i really wonder about the passage of time and and how this this is part of what made me ask like could it come out in a different place than how they're expecting is it possible that they have the like exit from the labyrinth redirect to a different area of the planet entirely can you do that i don't know because he is so far off here. Once they actually get outside, they are looking at the largest city they have ever set eyes on. And he's out here talking about how it's just like people and, and their sheep and some rolling hills. Like, you know, I'm just really wondering how he could get this so wrong. It has to be either time passing differently, which alarms me a little bit for our friends, or that he wound up coming out in a different place or there has been some massive sea change that happened and it was so abrupt that that can be alarming in its own way. Um, 
So let's see. Once they ascended to the fifth floor, the structure of this labyrinth shifted significantly away from sky holds. The paths tended towards straight lines and sharp turns rather than long curving paths. The levels were also, were also far less discreet, interconnecting vertically again and again. Over and over, the group found themselves having to descend a level, then ascend again to move on, or vice versa. Dead ends were more common here than in any other labyrinth they'd been in, and the traps were less traps than just environmental hazards, like open pits and the like. And I am like, again, you know, this is really, really... It's... I, I don't want to use the word alarming for this because it could be nothing, but it does put me on edge, I guess. I don't like any sort of unknown that feels so specific. I'm like, is this just a setup because they hunt the creatures in the labyrinth? And that's where this is sort of like they added areas within the labyrinth to trap and hunt. And that's why this looks so different, because it's not naturally occurring and they've decided to sort of make the most of it. Um, so Dan is saying, uh, I kind of just read it as they are well organized with a military and clean the labyrinth out regularly. You do get an answer to why the guide to worlds seems to be wrong. I, I trusted that we would. Um, so then there's a moment where he's noticing that like the stone on each floor is identical and they have like completely identical inclusions and grains and fossils. It's the somebody like reproduced the exact stone repeatedly to build these areas, which could be because a person did it, or it could be the labyrinth doing something really weird. I don't know how that would work. Um, and then there's runes on everything. And there's, so you guys know, I'm not going to, I'm not going to like fucking hammer on this, but I always have to mention when Beers is doing that repeating words thing. And I think it's actually getting worse. I don't know. I'm, my theory is that he started to write faster as he got further into the series and people were like, you know, asking for the next book and everything. And he was just sort of churning things out. I am thinking that maybe that's part of what was going on, but this section in particular is brutal with repeated words and phrases, really, really heavy on them. And it is like, I, I don't want it to bother me as much as it is, as I, it does, but it's so noticeable to me. And I do I'm really like wondering if anybody listening is also feeling that like, does anybody, because Dan is saying he needs you as a beta reader. I'd be happy to. Um, but I never like feeling like I'm being uh, a stick in the mud or kind of picky about things. And I don't think I tend to be you know, depending on the subject matter, of course, but this is something that I'm like, does anybody else get hung up on this? I, I listened to this section twice and both times I just, it was like jarring a few times. Um, I'm so, I'm so sorry. Dan, Dan says, I never noticed it until you pointed it out. Now I can't unsee it. This is like one of the first moments here is how often he uses the word wildly. And it's like almost always in conjunction with varied wildly. It's like he uses it so often and it happens within two sentences here, as well as the word arrange. It says that and the runes diverge wildly from block to block. They, these were only so many different ruins, a few dozen at most, but they were arranged in wildly different arrangements everywhere, which Yo, man, you don't need those both arrangements. You could say they were arranged wildly or arranged differently everywhere or while in wildly different configurations, but saying they were arranged in wildly different arrangements, my friend, and especially earlier having it be they diverge wildly from block to block. Um, it's just, again, later when we actually go into Kometria, the use of wildly varying is 
constant. It's all over the place. So they start to go up to the top floors and they get through an exit and then they stop dead because there is a group of people pointing weapons at them and they all stop and kind of take a moment, take a breath. And Godric is finally like, let me go talk to them. And Sabe says that maybe she should talk to them because she has the, like her affinities lend themselves to making really quick exits. I do enjoy too. I don't think I mentioned it, but there's like earlier, each of them is playing with the uh, wind jump affinity and they all are able to do it better than Sabe because it's like, she's kind of forgotten how her own shit works. That was very funny. Um, but Godric says he has a gut feeling that it would be better if he talked to them because his armor resembles the theirs the most closely. Hers is that wild looking storm armor. Now I'm looking, using the fucking word wild, but she, he has stone. And while theirs are paper, it's at least a little bit more recognizable. And I feel like there's something else that's like maybe causing them to listen to him. And I'm almost like, is it due to the skin color that he has? Because he like, these guys are described as also being black. And I'm not sure if that's a factor for them that they like consider. I, I don't know how patriarchy works in this world either, because later on, I know Sabe is also written as black and I don't feel like they give her much of a glance later, but they're paying a lot of attention to Godric. So I'm like, is it because he's a black man? Is it because he was the only one in armor they recognized? Is it like just his sheer size and the fact that he's sort of intimidating and they respect that? Like, I don't know, but they, it takes a while for them to be able to communicate. And the guy that they're speaking with is able to do like, he dips into a few different languages and some of them he's obviously stronger in than others, but it's pretty impressive to me that he can like do this as well as he can. And eventually they resort to sort of sign language and, uh, th th you know, just like speaking a word and pointing and eventually picking up on things. And, uh, Godric is able to tell him who, what his name is and his friends. And this guy is like getting it pretty quick. He's clearly good with this stuff. And uh, Godric is able to, zero in that his name is Apchek, which is, I don't know why, but I really like that name. Um, Dan says, Evan Curry is another author. I really like, he doesn't just repeat words. He will repeat entire paragraphs of expository dialogue. So it could be worse. <gasps> Dan. Oh my God. That would drive me fucking batshit. How do you, how, like, there are going to be times where that's purposeful, but it's not sounding like it's, you know, so w come on. Do you not edit your own stuff? Like that's really rough. Ooh, boy. Um, I love to Godric. He takes his armor off and like, these guys are pushing 10 feet with their armor on because they have, the what I keep picturing is that these guys have what amounts to like Iron Man armor where it's way huger than you and does things like that. It only needs you inside as a sort of battery, but you don't have a whole lot to do with it. And when they see that Godric takes his armor off and he is still fucking humongous, they're all just like, well, damn. And there was something about that that I found really endearing. And Godric is even looking at their armor and he's like, this shit may be paper, but it is strong AF and I don't know if mine could beat it. And I'm really glad that I don't have to test that out right now. So then we go to 29 bureaucracy at work and they come out of the labyrinth into a sort of, she describes it as an inside out castle. And the reason for that is the, like all of the, protective measures are on the outside of the walls directed inward, which makes a lot of sense. If you're trying to protect an area from what comes out of the labyrinth, you would have it set up that way. There's also butcher shops where they're butchering all of these like 
you know, monsters. And she's thinking about how there are gourmands who eat some of the labyrinth animals. And this is so... <laughs> Just the idea that people do this. Of course they do. You know, I love food and I'm really, I enjoy trying new things, but I'm never going to like, I'm, I don't see myself ever attempting something like a uh, blowfish, you know, which is very dangerous or some people are like, get a kick out of eating endangered animals, which is really sick to me. Like what is wrong with you? Um, but th here goes another moment with the double words she'd heard of particularly daring gourmands who ate labyrinth monsters but since said creatures were the product of ecosystems on alien worlds with utterly unknown ecosystems guy just say we're the product of alien worlds with unknown ecosystems you don't got to do this most of them ended up poisoning themselves eventually not usually fatally but it took a special kind of fool to keep risking it after one poisoning. And that is so... Ugh, why? But because we can. Because human beings are silly, goofy fools. Um, and let's see. There was no easy way to tell what the Cometrians intended to use the corpses for. So Sabe shrugged and went back to studying the people around her. And that got me... That was another thing that kind of made me go, well, what? Like, it's not that people don't use parts on Anastas. It's just that there's no evidence exactly of what they're doing. It doesn't, like, there's nothing specific that she can see where they're piling all the legs in one area and all the eyeballs in another area and they're labeling them for sale. Which... I'm sort of wondering, do they make their bodies into the paper they use to create the armor? Is the armor paper actual plant-based paper or is it something else? And it is the, the sort of like, I don't know, because what I'm thinking of is, is in Cradle, there are uh, sacred beasts that can also grow as like intelligent and good with magic as human beings. But then there are others that are, you can like harvest and take their binding is called out of their body. And their binding is sort of a main source of all of their magic. And you can use that binding to create a variety of weapons and objects. And I'm sort of wondering if these animals have something like that, that can be used. And if that's part of how they power things because the fact that they use it's clear people have magic here by the way they're powering up the runes when they go to see the different workshops later but that does not mean that's the only way they use magic you know so i was just sort of wondering if there's something else going on here um and she's looking around at all of the different people and having a few moments of like some of these people are pretty fine actually uh and then here we go all the men were clean shaven but there was a wild variety of hairstyles among men and women alike and we get a lot of descriptions of all of them and the cometrian soldiers are curious about our group but they seem to be really paying the most attention to godric a little to talia's tattoos and mackerel but Sabe and Hugh aren't interesting to them, which I'm going with the fact that they take things that have like Godric seems like the leader of the group. So that may be its own thing. I'm also sort of assuming Talia's tattoos being close to the not actually the way it functions, but because they inscribe everything with runes and she's covered in markings that maybe they would see them and think they were meant for something and be trying to figure that out because it's like familiar and mackerel i think has a lot of runes on him as well so that might be why with him um and sabe and hugh are kind of the more ordinary looking out of the two of them but i don't know um most of the soldiers had glowing rune tattoos on their arms or wrists, ones that glowed in the same colors and pulsed to the same rhythm as the runes on their weapons. Other than the runes, their spears and crossbows looked fairly normal, and she didn't know enough about Cometrian magic to guess what the magic did. 
And she's just looking around kind of like, I cannot believe we are here. This is insane. And I, and she's even thinking about how all of them, and she's not counting herself among them. The other three have the potential to become great powers quickly. And she does not see herself being able to match them. And she's not like, poor me about it. She's just kind of like, mm, I don't have the kinds of like attacks that would be useful. I don't, I don't see it. And it's interesting because like now we've been in the, the minds of three of them. I can't remember if this really happened with Godric, but I definitely remember it with Talia. And of course with Hugh, each of them has had moments of like, I don't know if I can keep up with my friends and I don't know if they're going to need me or am I, am I going to be like the weak link? And I hadn't expected it with Sabe, but it makes sense that she is, has such a political mind that this does not seem like enough of an advantage to her. And all I wanted to say to her was like, Sabe, I feel like you could become a great power simply because you are packed to these other great powers. I'm not sure that it, I don't know how, what boxes exactly you have to tick, but I would hazard a guess. This would be enough to carry you. And then you've got your political astuteness, which would really be the icing on the cake. And yeah, I think you would be fine. You know? Um, so she's, and also like some of the new affinities she has, she has no idea how she would use them. And I'm just thinking, well, given a second, you, you just did this. You just began sharing your affinities. So you've hardly had any time to even think about it. Have a little bit of imagination, you know, just sort of like theorize with your friends and bounce things off each other. And I bet you'll come up with some wild stuff. Um, so there's also a ring around Kemetria, which is like, like the rings around Saturn and it fills the sky. And this is the kind of thing that I think is so fascinating. Like, can you imagine seeing something like that? It, you're the whole scale of the world would feel off because of something that huge and that close to your planet taking up such a gigantic portion of the sky. I can't imagine we don't have anything like that. You know, the closest that we could get are like cloud formations that are big, but our sun and our moon are fairly small. Most of the time, the largest that they get is not that impressively large and otherwise not a lot in our skies that kind of, you know, fill things up from end to end. The, the closest I can think of really is a rainbow. And even those can be sort of small. Um, so they all stand and like stare around for a little while, which, uh, Apchek seems very amused by. And they're looking around. There's all these soldiers and she's noticing that the walls were like 30 feet thick, had, so, have so many runes on the outside that it's like impossible to read them. They're so dense and packed together. Um, and she notices that the like stairs up to the walls are not on the inside. They're on the outside and the murder holes point inward. And that's the part where I'm just like, look, I am willing to accept that this is just because they're going to try and keep their people safe from what's in the labyrinth. But, but what if it's not that simple? What if it's something else? And then the fact that, so Off to one side, she noticed a huge stable, but instead of horses, suits of lacquered paper armor were kept inside perfectly clean stalls. Now, I found it kind of weird that we're storing these suits of armor in an area that it looks like could potentially be attacked by creatures from the labyrinth. I'm assuming it's because they're so, like, borderline indestructible, they don't have to worry, and that it's best to have them in the place their, their soldiers are occupying, but I, I was a little bit taken aback by that. Um, and again, the armors varied wildly in size and ornament. And 
the the descriptions of these they do sound really cool like different you know helmet designs and uh what is it the one he describes uh pauldrons the biggest suit loomed in a special shed of its own and was easily three-fourths the height of archer's armor its runes were a vibrant green and the helmet was sculpted to look like a massive mantis head Decorative elements across the massive armor worked to give it a chitinous appearance. Next to the armor was a rack of rune-enchanted spears even taller than the armor, each of which had a whole tree trunk as a shaft. And I'm just like, that's terrifying. But then there's a suit that's only 15 feet tall. This one was made from countless strips of deep black paper with purple runes that were almost the same shade as Sabe's own new eye color. Its shape seemed well balanced between bulk and grace, and even sitting empty it seemed far more lethal than the other suits. A huge metal shield with runes covering the backside rested in a rack next to the armor, along with a particularly nasty-looking rune sword. And when she asked Godric about it, he is able to surmise those like the most of this armor is about killing monsters, but this armor is for killing other armor, which I find really worrying. I don't really like what's that for though? Like, why do you need it? Is it for people like Godric? Like, what? I don't like it. So, she, (laughs) there's a spot. To Sadie's amusement, she spotted one worker who clearly had nothing to do and was trying to look busy by sorting the contents of a pair of boxes, but he was obviously just moving things endlessly back and forth between them. So, again, am I reading into things too much? Or is that a weird moment of them not wanting to, our friends to see what they're really doing. Because that was how I took it. She was sort of smiling to herself as like, oh, here goes somebody who is just doing, you know, fake busy work so that they don't get told, like get assigned anything else. And I was kind of like, what if the thing they normally do isn't something they want you to see? And so this person is just doing a bullshit nothing job because they can't resume their actual work until you guys are no longer able to see them. I know I'm very suspicious and it might not be anything. It may just be a little bit of a goofy joke, but it feels like in combo with everything, it's suspicious. So Apchek gets out of his armor. There's a (laughs) Dan says, I hope you aren't this suspicious in real life. You know, that's a good question, Dan. I'm not really sure if I am. Because I, you know, in books, you know that there's a rhyme and reason. One person was in control of the narrative. So it's a lot easier to assign meaning to things. And I am not really somebody who, like, tends to think of God putting things in place. So I think if I were that type, I'd be much more suspicious in real life. But I I don't think I am usually in life. I think it's just reserved for fiction because I assume there's always something I don't know about that the author is sort of like gleefully planning, you know? Um, so it takes a, a little bit for him to get out of his armor. There's like attendants who have to, uh, like clean out the armor on the inside who I kept thinking of as, um, Oh my God, I was going to say, and then I could, the word completely left my mind. But the sort of role that Podrick Payne plays for Brienne, a squire, that's the word I wanted. So that was what I was thinking of these guys as. But I don't think it's like, a squire is much more personal. You're assigned like one that you're meant to mentor. And that's not what this sounds like. Um, and he has, Apchek has tattoos like on all of his joints, covering his hands and feet. And... Uh, She's just interested in the fact that like those seem to connect to the armor, which I, that makes some sense that maybe they, the runes 
join the motion of his body to the armor itself. So he can move as if he were in his own body and it causes the armor to move with him. Um, and Sabe says the magic, the magic is like way more advanced than Galvacrin said. I don't know how right he is about this. But behind them, Sabe noticed a couple of attendants cleaning out. She didn't envy them that job. Once they made it through the gate and inside the wall, it turned out there was something else that didn't change from world to world. Paperwork. Lots and lots of paperwork. So they have to fill all of this out. And they're given a copy. And it seems a little silly because they're given a copy when they can't actually read it. I appreciate, too... The fact that Galvacrin is so wrong about this world or just out of date means that Galvacrin isn't going to have really any information on the language, I guess. So it doesn't seem like there's any way for them to even attempt to translate stuff. Um, stylized fish, turtles, and lizards, but the most common were various birds and bird tracks. When Apchek filled one line with stylized animals, instead of moving back to the beginning of the next line, he started writing backward across the next line. It was almost hypnotic. And I was like, that honestly makes a lot more sense to write that way. Like, instead of having to, like, read to the end and then snap back to the beginning and go, you can just read fluidly down each side. I feel like I like that better. And I, we should just stop doing things the way that we do them. And I know that there are lots of languages that read from right to left, but I don't know if any of them do that kind of like fluid, uninterrupted line of motion. I'm sure there's something out there, but it's new to me. And I think it sounds like it would be much more simple. Um, and he slid several sheets for them to sign. They had no idea what they were signing, but it's not like they were planning to stay or even visit it again, most likely. So she wasn't overly worried about it. I don't like that. I don't approve of anyone forcing a person to sign something when they can't read it. It's not even like they can offer an explanation of what it is. There is no translating all of this. So they are literally completely blindly putting their name to a thing. And I am extremely concerned. Like you just, that's mm, like, it could simply be for the bureaucracy or there could be something magically binding about signing it. And that's so much worse. And the, I don't know. I just do not like this. Um, so again, they have to like sort of wait here. There's a moment where Godric is thinking about creating a chair out of stone and then he doesn't do it. And he doesn't because he's worried the Kemetrians might freak out about seeing the way his magic works. I personally was more like, just don't show them what you can do. I don't like the situation. They seem like they're trying to be cool with you, but you don't know enough about them and keep some fucking like some tricks up your sleeve. That's all I'm saying. Don't let your enemy know everything you're capable of. So eventually they go to this room and it's a, an exchange, like a money exchange so that they can change over their Ithonian coins and get some of the coins from this world. And this was another thing where I'm just kind of like, what's up with this? Um, the coin exchange involved even more paperwork once it was done. The whole process seemed highly unusual and was clearly a disruption of everyone's routine. Sabe was as irritated about the whole thing as Apchek or any of the clerks. No one involved with the process actually seemed to want to be a part of it. Again. Maybe that's nothing. But there's a part of me that's sort of like, it's being framed as bureaucracy. Am I right? Nobody wants to do it. Everybody has better shit that they have overdue in their inbox that they need to be working on. Can we just get this over with so we can go back to our own shit? And maybe that's all it is. But maybe nobody wants to be part of this because there's something distasteful about it. And the reason I say that 
is because eventually Apchek leads them to a like area where they can see the city and gives them a map and the paperwork which they think is like supposed to be an introduction to people for them to show them and Hugh thinks it's weird but Apchek looks sad as he walks away and I just feel like the fact that he looks sad it simply could be hey you guys seemed interesting and weird and cool and I would have liked to spend more time finding out about you but I have a job and I have to go back to it so bummer I have to leave you alone sorry about it or it could be I am putting you into a situation that I know isn't awesome I'm not really proud of it and I regret having to do it. And if he is feeling like that, it's possible the people here with the money are also feeling this way. Because like, let's be real, they're doing the things that it seems like you would need to to ensure a fair exchange in this money. But I don't know how much our friends are even able to do look like the types of math and physics to figure out the density of their money and whether they're being ripped off or you know what I mean? And also like, what if they're being played and maybe these people just kind of feel gross about the fact that they're also stealing their money, you know, it, like I just, there's a sense of something distasteful that, nobody really wants to be part of. And I don't know if that's simply the nature of being in a workplace when everybody, it's like, you know, 4.30 on a Friday and all of these assholes just come walking in and make it so that you're not going to be able to leave until 5.30 instead of 5, which really is so fucking annoying. It may just be that. But also it might not be. It might be something very, very different and dangerous. Like, you know... So this is when they see the city and it's just so incredibly massive. Uh, massive suits of paper armor loomed at street corners, keeping watch over crowds. Messengers ran across rickety networks of walkways, bridging the roofs of the city, carrying alarmingly huge bundles on their backs. The city, even just at a glance, was obsessed with birds. Brilliantly colored parrots riding on the shoulders, falcons carried by soldiers, huge flocks of pigeons being fed by the elderly, songbirds hanging in cages by the thousands in nearby storefronts, bizarre stone and metal sculptures offers, offered roosts for entire flocks. Many of the hovering carts were being pulled by colorful flightless birds bigger than the ostriches often used to pull carts in Ras Andes. Unlike the terror birds they'd run into in the labyrinth, Sabe was fairly sure these ones were vegetarian based on their beak shape. The city wasn't just filled with living birds either. There were stuffed birds, tapestries of birds, and banners with stylized herons and eagles on them all over. And I'm just sort of wondering, like, what if our humans here are not at the top of the food chain? What if all of these creatures are being butchered so that they can be fed to giant bird-like gods? Have you thought about that? Hmm? Have you? Just, you know, for instance. Um... So he gestures, calls it headrest, and then we go to chapter 30, and Hugh is the POV we jump into, so we don't really see the conversation that he has with Sabe and Godric. And I say conversation, but it's all gesturing. And Hugh is struggling with, like, not knowing whether this fucking ritual worked. He has a moment thinking that he's maybe thought of why it could be dampened, but he experiments and it doesn't seem to be that. Talia is keeping an eye on him. Everybody is, to be honest, but Talia is the only one that really says anything to him. And he doesn't even really want to talk about it, which I totally get. So he just shakes his head. Um, and let's see. They watched the crowds go by. The crowds were a ridiculously diverse bunch. Most people looked like the average Kemetrian soldiers they've met so far, but a big chunk of the passerby varied wildly. Get that, guys? 
<laughs> Not only in physical appearance, but style of dress. They ranged from heavily armed warriors in furs to scribes and functionaries wearing elaborately embroidered robes, and many of them could have fit in seamlessly into crowds back home. There were a lot more feathers woven into hair and clothing than he was used to, though. And the runes are the main thing. They are all over everything, everywhere. And later on, we have this, like, you know, interesting look at a kind of, it, it made me think of, like, a factory, really. But here's the part. He, he could have sworn the last look Apchuk gave them as he departed was a sad one. But that couldn't be right. And I was like, couldn't it? <laughs> um, at this point, Godric says, I think a lot of that paperwork was supposed to be filled out whenever anything comes out of the labyrinth. I'm pretty sure I saw some of the same paperwork near where they were butchering those monster corpses. Oh, did you? Did you, Godric? Did you see the same paperwork around the things that they were butchering? I'm just wondering... Why nobody else seems alarmed. Maybe it's just what he said. We all came out of the labyrinth, and that's all it is. We came from a place. It's immigration. But also, maybe there's something going on. Dan says, does your average DMV worker alarm you too? Yes. Dan. Yes. Are you kidding me? Oh my God. Don't even get me started. <laughs> <laughs> so they begin to move into the city and they just decide like this paperwork is what we have to show to people. And the main thing that Sabe is interested in is getting a, a room in an inn and being able to like take a, a break, which uh, I keep forgetting how long it's been since they have had a break. You know, they've just been like straight up traveling. And I think they had one pause where they slept. I think that might have been it though. But anyway, um, at this point, they're like, well, how are we going to find where we're going? And Hughes says it shouldn't be too hard. It's a really distinctive three peaked limestone mountain. We should be able to see it if we get up somewhere with a good vantage point. And my concern here is that he has been given a description based on a part like based on a universe that has changed so dramatically that what if that mountain isn't there anymore? What if it's totally different looking? What if the peaks are gone or so, you know what I mean? Like it's just, there are a lot of variables. Once we see how totally different this place is compared to what they were promised that make it worrisome, whether they can rely on the information at all at this point. He says, Galvacrin said it's just a few weeks travel straight across the plains and it's hard to get lost so long as you have a way to see above the grasses and stay oriented on the mountain. Which, um, I kind of wanted Sabe to just shoot into the air with her, you know, wind affinity. But I don't know how that, if that functions the exact same way here. And also, I already said that I don't think they should be showing their potential enemies what they can do. So I'm not faulting them for not doing this, even though that doesn't seem to be a consideration in their minds. I just felt like it's probably for the best. It did not occur to them. Um, so they all have a moment where they're like, well, let's go. And they don't move. And Godric is like, I know that we were in a universe where the sun could kill you, but this is making me a lot more like anxious. I don't love this. And they finally just like are able to sort of break through it because Mackerel is cranky at it being constantly pointed out that he is maturing and causing less trouble. And he basically throws a spitball at Talia and that breaks the nervousness. <sighs> 
pickpockets made no less than three attempts on Hughes valuables within the first few minutes of entering the jostling crowds, which, um, yeah, if you're seeing people who it seems like don't really know their way around, obvious tourists, you're going to target them. You know, they're going to be very distracted. They're not going to know who, who to go to for help. Like, don't speak the language, although I don't know how much these people know that. But eventually one of them, like, fucks around with Mackerel and finds out because he breaks a couple of her fingers, which I was like, that's pretty rough. <laughs> Um, so the, they all are keeping their shit in storage tattoos. So, you know, even if the pickpockets were able to get to them, they wouldn't find anything. Uh, before they'd taken their first turn down a side street, Hugh had seen vendors carrying fruit like something out of a fever dream. Tailors selling silk to ordinary workmen as though it was as cheap as wool, which Hugh hadn't seen a single scrap of yet. And I'm just like, I thought. He like I guess he doesn't specifically say that they're shepherds, but he does say that they're like nomads and pastoral. And in my mind, I immediately think of sheep, but maybe it's birds. Maybe the birds aren't the gods. Maybe they're just their main source of food and fuel the economy, you know? Um... He saw a shop selling nothing but various crystals, often worked into metal sculptures of birds and feathered lizards. They were among the few things Hugh saw that weren't covered in runes. And then we get the rune workshops, and they stop and stare in at one of them, eventually to the point where a worker comes out and sort of yells at them. And I was just like, if you don't want people stopping and looking, why do you have these giant open shutters, my friend? Maybe you just need to get some like one way glass if it bothers you. Um, I love too, that it's specifically mentioned. They come to a stop to stare heedless of the snarls and traffic they were causing fucking tourists. Am I right? As the rune carvers worked, Colored light drifted from their hands to the runes, growing steadily brighter as they worked. Carving the runes seemed to be a slow process, and activating them took even longer for most workers. They weren't actually powering the runes. Galvacrin had actually gone into a little detail about the process in the guide. Once the runes were complete, they drew freely from the ether around them, but they did have to be activated first by the workers. Even the fastest took about 10 minutes per rune. And eventually, they see an old lady who's managing to do it in like five minutes, but she's a real outlier. Um, each worker was just carving the same rune over and over again. And when they passed the block, the next worker would inscribe the next rune in a set sequence. So this is what made me think of like a factory. It's like they've got an assembly line, basically. And there's a line of people that are just sort of waiting until someone taps them in and needs a break, which we do hear later that there are some places with not as great working conditions where there isn't a way to tap out, where people are being like overseen and driven a lot harder than this particular group. Um and we get, you know, descriptions of all of the things that runes get embedded in. And uh, by far the most common was dedicated to drawing runes on paper. There were literally more of them than every other kind of rune workshop combined. Ribbons of paper with beautiful but exact runes without any splatter. They all had waste baskets in case of rune drawings, but Hugh could tell that they were all well practiced with their brushes based on how few ruined sheets lay in the baskets. The overwhelming majority seemed to operate on similar principles. They sorted out their work duties between a large number of workers, with each of them attending a single small task repeatedly. There were a few of them that used more familiar methods, where one craftsman guided the process from start to finish, but they were dwarfed in number and output by the larger workshops. And then we hear about, like, the, you know, basically sort of sweatshot conditions, um, Sweatshop. I think I said sweatshot. <laughs> uh, no matter what method they used or how well the workers were treated, activating the rune seemed to take roughly 10 minutes for everyone. Um, and Godric at this point is like, I'm doing the math on this. And those fucking suits of armor have to each be at least a decade of work. And I mean, just only work. 
a decade of solid work hours. That's fucking bonkers. I love that Hugh and Talia whistle and Sabate tries to whistle, but she can't. There's something very endearing about that. I used to be able to whistle like I was really good at it. And then ever since I got this facial twitch, I have to get Botox injections to stop the muscle movement spasms. And it has resulted in me being like a lot less able to form the whistle like position with my lips. So I can barely whistle anymore. And when I can, I can only sustain it for a little bit before eventually the muscles like forcibly relax. And it's very frustrating because I used to whistle all the time. I, it was like, you know, and it's also an extremely good way to get the dog's attention. So it bums me out that I can't do it on command very easily. Um, so Talia is like, you could build a whole castle without using magic in that amount of time. And Sabe tries to say, you can't build castles without magic, to which he was like, au contraire, we got castles in Emblem. And Godric is like, yeah, my dad wanted me to study that because he thought studying the way that people handle stone when they can't use magic will make me better at handling them with magic, which makes Hugh kind of stop and go, oh, man, I really miss your dad. And I was like, yeah, fucking same. Um, and Godric says, constructing a castle without magic takes at least two or three centuries worth of work hours. You can still do it in a year or two if you've got a big enough workforce. And I think they, they're applying that same principle here. So you could build a castle in the time it takes to build one of the smaller suits, but one of the larger ones. And this leads to an interesting reflection by Sabe where she's like, I'm really wondering whether or not you can even have independent great powers in this universe because all of the magic is like a collective effort. No one person is able to do enough. It's all built off of the, the groups working together to combine their runes. And I thought that was a really interesting idea. You know, just that like there is a much more individualistic approach to magic on Anastas than either is traditional here or is even possible here. Um, and she says that th it's possible there's other ways on the planet, but it would be weird if there were other ways that were easier and faster and these this whole city didn't use those methods. Um, and she's like, we also don't know how strong the armor suits are. And Godric is like, they're strong. They're using them to defend against things to the, that are coming out of the labyrinth. Trust me, that's serious. Um, she does say though, I could be wrong. We're in one city and a tiny part of the globe. Like who knows? Uh, Assuming you're right, you're trying to figure out how you can try to do something similar back home, Talia said. I don't know if it's honestly possible. We're talking about two wildly different kinds of magic, one of which we only have the barest understanding. But it's not like economics doesn't play into our own magic, after all. And then we find out about fecal mages and the fact that they are so valuable because they're rare and they can just make your whole sewer system and your farming go really well and so they always end up rich and i just can't i love the idea that somebody was just in a q a with john beers and they were like are there shit mages and that opened a whole new door like my uh, what i like to think is that this hadn't occurred to john beers that this was a fan who was just out here thinking they were being funny and john beers stopped and was like yes yes there are and you know what they're millionaires i love it this is so great and fucking poor hugh who is still not totally tapped into like the magical universe he thinks they're fucking with him and is just like, ha ha ha. Wait, what? <laughs> um, 
So, yeah, Sabe is just like really struggling here because she's still wanting to take down these great powers, but she's not sure what's possible and what's not. And she's also really worried that she's just doing stuff for her own ego and not because she actually is trying to help, which one could argue if you're even worried about that, you're probably not going to fuck it up. But it's really easy to like tell yourself that, you know, and maybe that's not entirely maybe it's not that simple. Um. And Talia says, I don't think it's actually possible to act with only one motivation on anything. There's nothing wrong with that. And I was like, that's genius. I never really thought of that. But having more than one motivation is just the way you usually live. So trying to isolate things, that's kind of a fool's game, you know? Um, so at this point, Godric is like, well, if you do start to fuck up, don't worry, we'll tell you. And at this point, Sabe is like, all right, let's go find our inn because I'm getting stressed and we just need a break here. Uh, and that is the end of the chapter. So I am really worried about our friends. I don't like this. I'm like, are they going to wind up in one of those inns where the bed tips over and they all go flying down a chute into a big vat of boiling water? You know those, you know those ends, you know the ones. I'm just, I'm just anxious about it. That's all I'm saying. All right, guys, I'm going to wrap, but thank you all so much for hanging out with me. Thank you, Dan, for commissioning this. Hope you guys are having fun. And until next time, toodaloo, motherfuckers. Spoiled Network Podcast.